You are listening to the first broadcast of TBR Radio Presents, the Barnes Review Radio Hour, hosted by Dr. Edward DeVries, TBR Contributing Editor. The Barnes Review Radio Hour is a weekly audio journal of politically incorrect history in today's broadcast. Dr. Ed interviews former TBR editor Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson who pays tribute to our show's namesake, Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes. For the last two years, it has been my privilege to host TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour here on the TBR Radio Network. And Paul Angel, our TBR executive editor, and I were having conversations probably toward the end of the summer of 2019 about potentially having a show that would be more focused on the things that are happening in the Barnes Review magazine. And I like that idea, not only because it would give me the opportunity to do a second show here on TBR Radio, but also because the Dixie Heritage Hour was getting away from, I guess you could say, its foundation, which was Southern heritage, Southern history, things dealing with the Confederacy and the war between the states, Southern culture, Southern life. And so now TBR Radio presents the Dixie Heritage Hour can be all Southern all the time. Because that show will not have to be, you know, sidetracking itself to deal with things that are appearing in the magazine or even with other subjects. Not that World War II wasn't a very interesting subject, it was, or that the Korean War or the Vietnam War or Russia or uh, the history of Western civilization as a whole are not very interesting subjects to me. They are, and of course they are to our listeners. But this way we'll have the Southern Show, TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Show, which is now a half-hour format. And then this will be the hour-long show, and we're going to focus on the things that are appearing in TBR Magazine. And so welcome to TBR Radio Presents the TBR History Hour. Our intention for this, as the introduction said, is for this show to be a weekly audio journal of politically incorrect history, of politically incorrect thought, or as our namesake, Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes used to say, every week we are going to use this program to bring history into accord with the facts. And so with that spirit in mind, today's program is going to be a tribute to the late Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes. The founder of TBR magazine was... Willis Carteau, and Willis was very close and intimate friend with Harry Elmer Barnes. Unfortunately, Willis is no longer with us, and Harry Elmer Barnes is no longer with us. Most of the people now working at the Barnes Review magazine, at the American Free Press, and in the other enterprises that were established by Willis Carteau are younger men now. They're younger men then, they're older men now, or middle-aged men, like myself, But, for example, Harry Elmer Barnes died in 1968. I was born in 1972. Our guest today, who was the second editor of the Barnes Review magazine, becoming the editor back in 1999, Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson. Dr. Johnson was born just a few months before me in 1971. And so, again, he missed Dr. Barnes by a few years. And even if he had been alive during Barnes' lifetime, he would have been such a small child Even had he met Dr. Barnes, there really would not have been a relationship there. So I really couldn't just pick up the phone or put out some email feelers and find somebody who was a confidant or a friend with Harry Elmer Barnes. But I could find people who had been influenced by his great work. In fact, uh, myself, I'm influenced every day as a member of the TBR Board of Contributing Editors every day as I work for the magazine and as I also work in my own publication, the Dixie Heritage Letter, and in other endeavors that I have. I write for the Citizens Informer and the Nationalist Times and other publications as well. And I'm always reminded of what Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes said, bringing history into accord with the facts. That's my job as a writer, as a journalist, as a historian. That's my job. And so I wanted to find people who were inspired by Harry Elmer Barnes. And one of those was Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson, who is our guest today. Dr. Johnson, as I said, was one of the early editors of the Barnes Review in the early days of the magazine. Uh, Willis Carteau had hired him to be a writer. 
for uh, the, the Spotlight, which is now the American Free Press, and also for the Barnes Review magazine. And Dr. Johnson would become editor of the Barnes Review for a number of years. And then he would become a university professor. But even today, he still writes for the Barnes Review and is a member of the contributing board of editors. And Dr. Johnson is also one of my favorite guests to have interviewed during the last two years on TBR Radio. And the shows where I interviewed Dr. Johnson were amongst our highest rated shows. So our listeners, they like Dr. Johnson too. And so I asked Dr. Johnson today to talk to us just a little bit about Willis Carteau and Harry Elmer Barnes and his relationship with these men, be it with Willis Carteau in his uh, personal relationship there. And that's something that we're really going to talk about next week when we do a tribute show to Willis, who was the founder of TBR. But more specifically in this week's broadcast, he is talking about Harry Elmer Barnes reading Dr. Barnes's writings when he was in grad school, when he was working on his Ph.D. at the University of Nebraska, just absorbing himself in the writings of Barnes. When he became editor of the Barnes Review, he felt that was an important thing to spend time reading the writing of the man after whom the publication was named, and just how Dr. Barnes was a great inspiration to him. We'll talk about Dr. Barnes' life work, his legacy, how Dr. Barnes was uh, maligned and kicked out of academia despite his brilliance. And so this uh, episode is, I guess, called a tribute to the late Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes, for whom the Barnes Review is named. How familiar are you with uh, Barnes's work? In grad school, I read um, The Causes of World War I. When I was first hired by, by Willis, he was kind of required reading. Um, I disagreed with him over, over his um, Russia and World War I. But otherwise, he was, and of course, World War II, he was, he was great. Um, I recently, yeah, it's been a while, because I have his um, In Quest of Truth and Justice, which is the 1970s, the real long, it's a really a compendium which Willis gave me ages ago. I don't know much in detail, but I do know his general point of view. Okay. Because what I'd like to do is talk about a little bit about Barnes and, you know, basically maybe how he's inspired some of the work you've done or how he, you know, might even inspire you, uh, you know, in, in your writing for the Barnes Review and things today. Barnes ever inspired me. I mean, we do a lot of the same kinds of things. Well, and he became persona non grata in in academia pretty much for the same reason I did. The fact that he was at Princeton, you know, didn't, didn't help him. And of course, there was a there was a libel suit against him. British diplomat Robert uh, Venstart sued Barnes for libel in 1939. And then Barnes said it was a plot from the ADL to intimidate American history, which may well be true. Oh yeah, then then World Telegram dropped his column. Uh, it's in Lipstadt's book, Deborah Lipstadt's book. But yeah, but the one thing we you know the one thing we have in common is that we we're, we're treated the same way. And he was, you know, riding high in the academic world. And I was, you know, I, I wasn't as high as he was, but I, I did very well. And then one day, you know, everyone starts dropping us because we, we start saying things we're not supposed to. And right. in his case, it was mostly World War II issues, not World War I. You know, Harry Elmer Barnes, you know, his mantra, if you will, you know, uh, bringing history into accord with the facts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that doesn't exactly make you well liked with the uh, – what do we call them? The the court historians. I think that was his that was his 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 phrase too. Yeah. Yeah. And so, by very nature of you know what he was doing, you know, obviously he was going to make some some serious enemies for whatever reason. I mean, what is it? Has been it's been what seventy years now since World War Two has ended, and and yet you know, and all of the key players are dead, and and yet everybody. I say everybody, but, you know, everybody in the high levels of power insists on maintaining the fairy tale version in spite of the fact that, that whoever they could possibly be protecting is dead. You know, the funny thing, he was considered a leftist up until World War II because he was considered a part of the so-called, you know, progressive uh, historians. And he was, you know, he was close to Charles Beard and all those guys. But then all of a sudden, you know, World War II comes out, and he gets a very different reputation. Right. He completely, he completely, uh, and he also switched on Germany because initially he was very anti-German, 
before World War One, and then you know a year later, he completely switched. So I don't know what happened there. Actually, as the war began during World War One, he was huge pro World War pro war, and his writings. He wrote for an actual propaganda agency, the National Board of Historical Service, and they said his anti-Germanism was too violent to be acceptable. <laughs> right. So then, after the war, he completely did a 180. I mean, he could have. I guess he just changed his mind. And I've done that on, on things. That's a, that's one hell of a turnaround. Though. You know that mantra. You know, bringing history into accord with the facts. Does that inspire you in any way? I mean, how does that you know how does that affect your your mission even in in writing today for the Barnes Review and other publications? Well, we're supposed to. That's supposed to be what we all do. Right. Every journalist, every historian is supposed to do that. If you don't do that, then you're 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 a propagandist. It's a real simple. It's a real simple thing. I mean, I I cannot be. If I didn't think I was doing that, I couldn't live with myself. Because that means you're lying. So, uh, you know, Dr. Johnson, you and Harry Elmer Barnes have a lot of things in common. You know, you were both academic successes. You both kind of uh, at some point began to realize that the official historical record and the actual uh, facts of history were not in line. And, uh, you know, when you're lecturing and you're writing, you began to correct those, uh, those errors. And, of course, the powers that be didn't like it. And eventually you found yourself you know, being sort of shunned in the academic community and the same thing kind of happened to Harry Elmer Barnes. So, um, you know, how in your, so I guess just, you know, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your, um, you know, your experiences with Harry Elmer Barnes. Um, you know, how did you first become, how did you first become familiar with the writings of Harry Elmer Barnes? Let's start there. Near the end of my graduate school career, I read part of uh, uh, In Quest of Truth and Justice, uh, and then when I was hired by the Barnes Review in 99, 20 years ago, almost to the day, by the way, he became more significant, entered into, you know, I, I was an academic, but I wasn't in an academic job, because he, prior to World War II, was considered one of these, a progressive historian, so to speak, and he wrote for The Nation and, and stuff like that. World War II breaks out. And then afterwards, and the propaganda, the very similar kinds of propaganda that occurred after the war, took a similar point of view, um, really, you know, absolving Germany of, of responsibility. And of course, he's right in both cases. But inspired by Harry Barnes, uh, I did a bit when when uh, when I was hired by Willis. When you took the job at the Barnes Review, didn't Willis kind of pass out the Barnes books, and weren't they kind of required reading back then? But Willis and, and Harry, you know, had, had a had a personal relationship. I thought that I should start reading some of this stuff just because the journal was named after him. You know, the World War II stuff was brilliant. I loved it. Uh, but the World War I stuff, I mean, he was right in certain things. I thought he was wrong on a few things. So he was right in general, however. You had told so the World War II stuff. Went wrong. Right. You had told me that you thought that, that Barnes might have missed the mark on some things in World War I regarding Russia. What, what were those things? Well, the main thing that bothered me, and actually, you know, he, he goes back and forth on the issue. He, he thinks Russia had a certain responsibility for, for the war, which is extremely wrong. I have, I have several articles that blame Austria for the war um, for short term. Long term, of course, it's an English. They're, they're the one. I mean, you know, the World War I issue comes down to the fact that Britain was scared to death that two land-based powers – were growing so rapidly, and that was Germany and Russia, who had been allies most of the time. There's no way Britain can fight them both. So in this Machiavellian scheme, the British had to come up with a way to get them shooting each other. And that was that was World War One, and the 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 fulcrum, the, the the hot spot that they can do that, of course, was was in the Balkans. Barnes then kind of shifts gears and he says, well, Russia might not have been the main issue. France was. And he goes into great detail. Now, this is where I really, I really enjoyed. He goes into great detail explaining how the French Foreign Service was feeding the Russian government, those not Tsar Nicholas personally, the Russian government, a lot of propaganda and mythology that what Germany was planning on doing. The relationships, you know, Germany and Russia was actually very positive. 
Russia was one of Germany's major trading partners and vice versa. They had they shared a huge border. They had a lot in common uh, politically. The two monarchs were, were cousins. You know, they had a lot going for each other. Uh, now, Bismarck was very pro-Russian, but his successors weren't necessarily. So for a while, he did blame Russia primarily for trying to get rid of uh, Austria-Hungary and having more of an influence in the Balkans. It's simply not true, especially since Tsar Nicholas was vehemently against mobilization uh, for a long time. Um, but at the same time, I don't believe that, that Germany was in the wrong either. Uh, Austria-Hungary was the reason. Austria-Hungary was going to invade Serbia no matter what Serbia did. And that certainly is something that, that Barnes doesn't talk about, even though it's, you know, and it was wrong of him not to mention that. So he, he, he softens his view of, of Russia by then blaming the French, that the French were so concerned with using Russia against Germany that they were, that they were uh, willing to tell any number of lies to the Russians, claiming they had all kinds of secret documents, they were going to invade the country, you know, the terrible things like that. And so he kind of goes back and forth on it. That, that, that's the main issue that I have with, with Barnes. Russia had no interest in the war, certainly not after 1905 and the, the damage that the Japanese war did. And they certainly had no interest in supporting the British. If there's any two countries that were bitter enemies for centuries, uh, with the exception of, of course, the Napoleon uh, era. The two countries that were bitter enemies was Britain and, and Russia. If anything, it was a trick for London to get those two fighting each other. But they certainly had no reason to fight. And the only reason that Germany was sucked into the war was um, because of Austria. And Austria was was really the, the cause of it. And, and, and because they thought that they had German backing, they thought they had German backing and therefore their attack on Serbia you know, it, it's like it's like the punk kid in the playground who has a really big best friend. And he thinks he can do whatever he wants because he's always going to have this kind of backing. The French did tell the Russians that that wasn't going to happen. And remember, the Russian – and he doesn't mention this either. The Russian mobilization was only partial. And it was very clear that this was only against Austria-Hungary. The Russians went out of their way to say that this wasn't against the Germans. Um, because again, they had tremendous economic uh, relationships. So, you know, Barnes – for the most part, blamed the French, and he had he had some he had some um, some reason to do that. He does blame the British to a lesser extent, but he doesn't blame Austria, and he's he's wrong on that. Open your web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. As far as World War II, though, I know you had said that Barnes was pretty much, you know, spot on in his assessment of the causes and the effects of, of World War II. You know, what is it that you think, because I, I know that Barnes's real motivation was that he wanted to exonerate Germany. In other words, he felt that the Germans were really taking a bad rap after World War I. And, of course, you know, World War II, uh, you know, even today, a lot of things are being laid at Germany's feet that just don't need to be laid there. But, but what do you think it was that actually motivated Barnes to go from being such a strong advocate and such a strong supporter of, you know, the United States war cause as World War I was being fought to, you know, then however many years later now being the historian of the war, going back and saying, oh, oh wait wait a second here, you know, let's take another look at this, uh, you know, let's exonerate Germany here. What, what do you think motivated him to do that 180? Yeah, that's a, that's a lesser known aspect of him. When, when World War I started, he was vehemently anti-German. Anti By the end of the war, he had switched 180 degrees. I'm willing to say that the main reason, and, 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 I, and we, we've all come across these 
these uh, propaganda posters and movies and things like that that the uh, or you know books and things that the propaganda against Germany was so over the top was so ridiculous was so cartoonish that no academic that no scholar of any kind could accept it you know you've seen the the photo of the baby hanging from the german bayonet uh the german being being depicted as a monster with the helmet with a spike on it and things like that you know just slaughtering people blood blood dripping from everywhere uh cannibal eating eating people i mean it was so bad i mean i, I just don't know who who the, the americans or the, the british thought they were going to be convincing with this but they actually came out and said that you know if we don't defeat germany this is world war one now if we don't defeat germany they're going to take over the planet and they're going to enslave us and they're going to force us to speak german i mean the most ridiculous things uh and even the british royal house changed its name to windsor they didn't like their old their old german uh, german sounding name that's how bad it was the propaganda was so over the top so laughable it's very similar to the propaganda against Germany in, in, in World War II. And I think that – and I guarantee you, Barnes wasn't the only one. But the only – and it certainly wasn't in his professional interest to do this. It actually did a lot of damage in World War I and World War II. And, of course, he was a contemporary of, of both wars. I think it was simply that the propaganda was so overwhelming and it was so bad and it was so cartoonish, he couldn't take it anymore. If they had just been uh, rational about it, maybe he would never have changed. But you've seen the pictures. I've seen the pictures and what people were saying, uh, you know, beating up Germans, uh, Germans in America, uh, tar and feathering them, beating them was was um, was never punished. And it was uh, uh, considered a patriotic thing to do. That's how bad it got in this country. And I think that had a lot to do with it. No, you'd said that you were began to read Harry Elmer Barnes when you became the editor of the Barnes Review after you had uh, graduated from uh, from the University of uh, Nebraska. So as you started to read uh, Harry Elmer Barnes at that time, what did you learn? Well, the great thing about Barnes, and I, I concentrated mostly on World War I in his case, was that he uncovered a lot of documents from the era. Again, this is 1999. The Internet was only a couple of years old. Really, a lot of this stuff was not available at the time. Uh, but Barnes, being in Princeton at, at this period of time, had access to a lot of stuff. And a lot of the documents, uh, Britain and, and France in particular, uh, were extremely important. And reading those primary source documents were a big deal. And he often would, would publish them in full. The great thing about Barnes, which sometimes got tedious, but the historian has to do this, is he gets so into the minutia of these conversations. You know, he was especially in the British case, because it was actually done in English. That, that's, you really, you really got, to, you got to learn a lot of the detailed, the mentality that was happening in these foreign service organizations. And, and it shows you that that monarchs weren't the ones making these initial decisions. This was all being done, either the parliament that they had, which by the way, they all had elected parliaments at the time, uh, who were extremely pro-war, and the monarchs who were very anti-war. So this was a popular movement that the monarchs ended up getting, getting uh, carried away with. Neither monarch of, of Germany or Russia wanted this war. The only one who did was, of course, uh, Austria-Hungary. So uh, in getting into that in great detail, say this is the Foreign Service that was making these decisions and, and, and writing these reports and convincing people that this had to be done, that was something that Barnes did that really really helped me out a lot. Why do you think that these monarchs were so averse to the war? Uh, you know, they weren't able to, uh, to sway the popular sentiment, but why do you think they were averse to the war? And then why do you think that they failed, you know, to sway the pu public or the popular opinion? Well, you know, contrary to mythology, they, they were not absolute monarchs. That's largely a myth in general anyway. The reason is because monarchs represent the common good. They're, they're trained from birth to see the big picture. In a parliament, these politicians are being paid by wealthy um, economic actors, corporations and companies and banks who either stand to lose a lot or gain a lot from a war, banks especially. That had, that had a lot to do with it. These politicians may represent a district that, that has an interest in, in war profiteering or a, a, a score to settle or something like that. They don't see the big picture like a monarch does. So I mentioned before, you know, two monarchs in, in Germany and in Russia were, were cousins. 
they knew each other very well. They spoke each other's language, or at least Nicholas spoke, spoke German, and their economic relations were excellent. So he had absolutely no reason. Of course, the big, the big anti-war voice in Russia was Rasputin. Now, he didn't have much power, uh, contrary to mythology, but he was the one who said, if you get into this war now, you're never going to get out of it. And, and, and Nicholas was aware of this. When you're being told every day that Germany is planning on invading the country, especially in the Austrian case, that Austria is going to crush and engage, and when they, they did actually do a lot, of, a lot of atrocities against the Serbs in the war, and the Hungarians especially created the first concentration camp system uh, for the Serbs and uh, for other Slavs too, which, which has not really been dealt with in any detail yet. You you begin to you know you begin to sway, it easily be swayed. Uh, Tsar Nicholas created the first disarmament conference when he first took over uh, after his after his father's death to remove you know heavy weapons from Europe and, and, and to reduce armies and everything else. This man was dedicated to peace, which makes a lot of sense when you realize how fast these economies were growing. It did no it, it wasn't in any immediate economic interest, or at least long term economic interest I should say. For this war to break out, right. and the monarchs had a much better understanding of this than than people who were swayed by media, who were swayed by certain wealthy interests, and they're really dominated by emotion. But these monarchs were actually very good men, and they were highly rational, and they could see the, the long term, and they just didn't didn't see any interest in it. Right. Because these were the subjects that were of interest to Barnes, and so, you know, kind of give our listeners an idea of of the things that Barnes was writing, the things that Barnes was studying, the things that Barnes was focusing on in his work. But, you know, fast forwarding now to 1999 and you're becoming the editor of the Barnes Review magazine. And the Barnes Review at that time was about five years old. So it was it was still a, a fairly new magazine. You know, do you feel like the, the Barnes Review was was focusing on the same things that Barnes was focusing on? Or do you think that, that it was just inspired in its name you know, again, because of, of the mantra, uh, you know, bringing history into accord with the facts. I mean, you know, how much of, uh, you know, to, to what degree, I guess, it's kind of a weird question, but to what degree was the magazine in its early days a continuation of, of Barnes's labor, even though it wasn't established by Barnes himself? And to what degree, you know, was it just kind of inspired by Barnes's overall, I, I guess, call it, you know, tenacity or philosophy? Well, Willis Cardo knew uh, Harry Barnes fairly well. Once his academic career fell apart, he needed all the all the connections he could to get his things published and and all the assistance he 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 could get his hands on. And Willis helped him quite a bit. I don't know the details in that respect. He didn't talk about it very much, but um, they did know each other, and Willis was able to help him quite a bit. I mean, most of his his works at the end of his his career were self published. No one wanted to touch him. Given the, I mean, Barnes wrote a lot. You know, he has something like, you know, 50 books, 40 or 50 books um, on different subjects. Usually, usually it's European history, but he does other things too. Like, you know, Can Man Be Civilized from, you know, 1932. Um, he wrote a book attacking uh, Prohibition uh, in 1932. Um, he wrote something on social theory. He wrote something, he wrote, he wrote, um, yeah, he wrote, he wrote uh, Pennsylvania Penology. In 1944, about the the penal system in, in in my state, and then of course he wrote quite a bit on on historiography too. He wrote a history of historical writing, and that was the University of Oklahoma Press, which first came out in, in uh, 1938. So, and of course a lot of economic stuff. He was all over the place. His focus was was um, European history, but you specialize in European history like I mean, I do, of course. A lot of these other things come up, dealing with public policy, uh, economics, of course, the history of science. How, how do you avoid it? You know, European history, you, you have to have a, a tremendous knowledge of, of these, all these other subfields before you can even make sense out of it. So you specialize in a certain area, but that requires you to, um, to deal with a lot of other subfields, economics especially, science without question. There's no doubt about it. Um, so uh, to be honest with you, I, I really think, I think Barnes would have been very, very happy with what the Barnes Review did. It really was a – I even described it early on as you know, a, a pro-German publication, and that was the case in the 19th century. That was the case in the Middle Ages. Uh, it was a very pro-German publication. That, that was its, its, its mission to some extent. It wasn't its only mission, but in every issue, we had something, uh, usually more than one thing, concerning German history. You know, the very fact that someone like, like Barnes was willing to give up 
mean, he knew what was going to happen to him. He had to have been very, very dedicated to this. He had to have known it was true. And I did the same thing. That's something very powerfully that we had in common. I was willing to allow my academic career uh, to go straight to hell uh, rather than tell stories. When I was in academia, there was a lot of pressure on me, usually indirect pressure, but it was definitely pressure uh, from other other people. Just you know, you knew you were an outcast, and um, and that's really hard to watch everything fall apart because you're doing your job, and because we're so dedicated to this kind of thing, and everyone else is is going along to get along. It's um, we usually do better than they do. We know these issues much better because these people aren't really as dedicated as we are. So that's something I always admired about the guy. And we dealt with pretty much the same issues that Barnes did. And uh, that was something that Willis insisted on. He didn't state it that way. But, you know, Barnes was an expert in economics and the history of science and the history of writing in general. This is exactly some of the things that we dealt with in, uh, in the Barnes Review, too. So, but his, his overall political ideology, I, I can't really say. He may have moved farther to the right when he, you know, to the World War II stuff. But he was generally a liberal in, in the older sense of the word. You know, after World War One, so you know we were all done on the right of the political spectrum, but that wasn't necessarily the case with Harry. This was this was a far greater. Uh, his sweep of, of history was far greater than that. He wasn't involved in issues. You know, this was far far greater, far more fundamental than all that. So it, you know, he, he was extremely important. And once I was hired, I read a lot of his stuff, especially from that one compendium, which was I still have the copy that Willis gave me. As far as the Barnes Review was concerned, and that was my second education. Uh, I was never the same again after working there in a good way. The Harry Elmer Barnes had a lot to do with it. He'd be very proud of the organization. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are because you're listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. You like to hear about the latest financial trends and to know what's happening around the world and right here in the United States, the things that can directly impact you, your life, and the life of your family. And if you're like me, you do not rely on the mainstream media to obtain this information because, frankly, you know that you just can't trust them. Fortunately, there is an alternative news outlet with a long-established track record for honesty and integrity, and that is the American Free Press. AFP is the preeminent alternative independent news source for honest, hardworking, truth-loving Americans. AFP is the antithesis of the controlled lamestream media. AFP is employee-owned and has been so since its founding. Because of that, AFP never has and never will allow advertisers or special interests or big money to dictate what appears in the pages of the American Free Press newspaper. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. AFP covers the stories and tells the truth that the lamestream media is frankly scared to touch. And AFP offers real, on-the-scene reporting and commentary, the likes of which you will never see in the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or just about any other lamestream news source that you can think of. That's right. There's only one national populist news weekly staffed by an unsurpassed team of veteran investigative journalists who will dare to rip the veil off of many of the major news stories that are being censored and suppressed by the big-money-controlled media monopoly. And that's the American Free Press. AFP publishes exciting, in-depth, uncensored news and information that's grassroots and patriotic, information that Americans need to know in order to combat the growing police state. AFP stands firmly against the New World Order and against those who are working to establish a global plantation under the rule of a powerful few. In short, AFP is your voice. If you have any doubt why they want to silence AFP, you must be relying on the lamestream media for your news. And folks, that's a big mistake. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. <laughs> 
And so you had talked about, you know, you and Barnes having in common that you had both basically been ousted from academia. Uh, I'm going to guess that a lot of what happened to you was probably very similar to what happened to Barnes. Of course, I'm, you know, all the details might not be exact and you might not know, you know, the exact details of what happened to Barnes. But just based on what happened to you, you probably could lay out for our listeners kind of what is the general process that gets used to, to push somebody like yourself or, you know, a Harry Elmer Barnes, you know, off of the uh, off of the, the podium, so to speak. I'm not sure what they did um, to Barnes. If you didn't have the tenure system in his day, the tenure system is a post-war. In my case, I was simply removed. You know, when your, your services are no longer required. I don't know what they accused Barnes. Barnes of. I don't know if they tried to get him on something else, but without tenure, they didn't really have to give any explanation. There, there's a few ways that, that they can get rid of somebody. Number one, they could accuse you of some kind of, you know, crime, a sexual, something embarrassing, you know, that's been done quite often. Number two, they could just make your life very miserable. They could force you to teach things you don't want to teach. Number three, they could put a lot of indirect pressure on you. Where professors and students, you know, protest you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want you not a part of anything anymore. That makes your life very, very difficult. You know. Now again, none of that was the case with me. I don't know how Harry was in the in the classroom, but I was. And this is something I did very, very well. I was extremely popular. My classes were packed, jammed. My student evaluations were were the most flattering things I've ever heard. As all my colleagues were getting ripped to pieces, I'm being praised. I mean, you had students. Who came to Mount St. Mary's just just to be just to study with me? You, I had two students left when I left. One went to CW Post, the other one went to Maryland. I was extremely popular. It really hurt them to get rid of me, which suggests to me that there was a lot of pressure put on them. When someone that popular um, was, uh, I mean, the other pressures, classes were empty, and mine were you know were packed. I wasn't any easier than anybody else. And actually, I was quite quite the contrary. They just like my style. You know, they always say I can make anything seem – I can take the most obscure thing and make it seem interesting and, and exciting, and I can do that. So it really hurts that that part of my life that I'm very, 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 very good at uh, has been taken from me. Uh, I think with Barnes, it was more explicit uh, – more explicitly ideological. It's really hard for them to do that today. You know, they, they can't come out and say, we don't like your ideology, therefore we're firing you. That makes them look terrible. I think given the era, that was much easier to do with, with Harry Elmer Barnes. I don't know, and I've never come across the explicit reason why he was removed. Um, but we ended up living the same kind of life, you know, smaller schools. Uh, uh, he didn't have online stuff, but, but you know, uh, adjunct positions, or writing, translating, that kind of thing. We ended up doing the same sort of things, uh, using smaller publishing companies. Um, so, you know. Uh, the fact that he was at Princeton for a long time didn't save him. You know, it didn't it, – it, that wasn't enough. And especially after World War II and everything that he was saying, because he was the very first dominant um, revisionist. And he was used to this. Of course, he knew German. Uh, he, he had so many contacts over there. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he was very dangerous to the regime. You know, we're good at what we do. We're not polemicists. We're not propagandists. We put these things in an academic and, and very highbrow way that they really hate. They would love for us to just, you know, use foul language and, and, and yell and scream. That would be great, but we don't do that. So, and that's something very powerful that we had in, have in common. Therefore, taking the positions that we did, it's not in our interest. Um, it, it was it was against our interest. And so, in that sense, you know, they know what kind of people we are. That we're not going to give this stuff up. And so, getting rid of us was their was their only option. And it's, you know, it still it hurts very badly. And especially because my, my fall wasn't nearly as, as, as great as Harry Elmer Barnes's. And I know that that really had the dam damage to his psyche, the damage to his uh, finances, the damage to everything. And, and I know how it feels. Harry Elmer Barnes, one of his big jobs throughout his life was he was an editor at Foreign Affairs magazine, which, of course, is the Council on Foreign Relations publication. And as I understand it, he may have been a member of the Council of Foreign Relations for a number of years, which would have made his 
which would have made his departure from orthodoxy even that much more uh, painful for him because obviously the CFR is one of those organizations that has the responsibility of maintaining the fairy tale both for World War I and especially for World War II. You know, a lot of our listeners would probably hear Council on Foreign Relations and automatically, you know, conspiracy theories, the New World Order, you know, globalism, uh, you know, the Antichrist. You know, those are the images that come to mind when you hear Council on Foreign Relations. And then to hear that a man like Harry Elmer Barnes was one of them. You know, how do you reconcile that for our listeners? There's nothing to reconcile because by 1924, it was over. He went to work for the Center for the Study of the Causes of the War. That was a Berlin academic institute, which apparently was financed by the by the uh, 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 German government. It was founded by um, uh, von Wengerer, who was um, a nationalist there, who had been a major in the in the German army, and his entire purpose was to um, defend German German reputation in, in 1914. And of course, to make war on the Versailles Treaty. And so he actually, you know, went over there. He lived over there, and that's how he got his hands on so many uh, research materials. So by 1924, he was long since removed from uh, from foreign affairs. In his position at foreign affairs, he was what they used to call the bibliographic editor, which meant he handled book reviews. So he wasn't really involved in close editorial stuff. Um, but the minute he, you know, they kind of said, you know, you're out of here, um, either as a cause or a result, when he went over to Germany and, and, and worked for the Center for the Causes of the War, um, that's it. He was, he was gone from, from that, elite, uh, that elite movement. And he even met, he met uh, Wilhelm II when he was uh, in exile in the Netherlands. And so this man, you know, Barnes was very, very close to some of these uh, elites uh, at the day. And both Barnes and um, and uh, the the exiled monarch said it was Jews and Freemasons, and, and their meeting when he was in exile uh, that was one of the leaders of the starting the war to destroy the Christian religion. Which, in saying something like this, by the way, generally removes you know, Russian guilt and puts that on the French uh, revolutionary state. So there's really nothing to reconcile. In that sense, because the minute he took the position he did, he was gone and he moved over to Germany, started working for them. And that was it. So, you know, Barnes could have made a lot of money. And in, in earlier, younger in his career, he was making quite a bit of money writing the official history of World War One for the victors. And yet at some point in that, he decided he was going to go and make less money, you know, coming the, to the defense of the losers. You know, obviously, he had to have been confronted with some great truth to have to have had that kind of a moment. Well, the reason that we get into this field, and for some of my colleagues, I really question them on this. And you know, what would be the point of of getting a PhD in history or politics or economics, only to get out to university and just say what everyone else is saying? What's the point of all that work? In that case, you're just a bureaucrat. You're just it's just a gig you have just to just to repeat the same kind of nonsense. And I don't know how those guys live with themselves. I, they're not real scholars. They may be intellectuals, maybe academics, but they're not real scholars. Our job is to tear away the curtain. Uh, our job is to is to get rid of the images, uh, to make war on propaganda, not to not to assume it's true. Uh, when I see academics and journalists simply accepting whatever the ruling class says. And claiming to be scholars, it, it makes me sick to my stomach. And these are exactly the guys that do very, very well. The average academic is making six figures, even even at a low level today. I don't know how they how they live with themselves. I couldn't do it. I don't care. You know, I, I live a relatively poor poor life, but at the very least, I'm much freer than those people. And that was worse. It's worse today than it was then. But you're you're hired as a young professor at a university. If you're a white male, you're already in trouble. You're already being watched. What these guys tend to do is overcompensate. And so they'll say the most vicious anti-white and anti-male stuff they can so that they can go you know, just be beyond reproach. I don't know if some in some case that they actually come to believe it or if it's just because the job is so good and so relatively easy and the money is so good 
and you're surrounded by, by pretty girls all the time. And being a professor is such a, such a, a prestigious thing um, that they're compensated so well in all those areas. You have summers off, you know, um, you never have to, when you get tenure, you never have to worry about your job again. And the only thing you've got to do is tout the line. Despite the pressure that I personally felt, I couldn't do it. The only reason that I did as well as I did was that I was a nice guy. I was easy to talk to. I was very, I was very pleasant to be around. I only began to talk politically once I got to know everybody. Once I became friends with everybody, then I started to talk about this stuff. You can't do that on the first day. But once they know you're a good guy, it's much less damaging to start talking like that. So that's how I did it. Now, I don't know in, in Barnes's case. But we both – that started off this as your kind of ordinary paleo con back when I started in, in St. Louis in 93 in grad school. I began reading E. Michael Jones and Michael Hoffman and even William Pierce. And I could, you know, what do you do? It's either true or it's false. It's true. So now I, I, have, to, I have to start asking questions. I have to start you know, doing things that started getting a lot of suspicion thrown at me. This grew and grew and grew until, um, well, something happened. I don't know exactly what happened that got me removed from, from Mount St. Mary's. Uh, I was never told. Uh, but there, there was some critical mass where they just couldn't take it anymore. And either they came to this decision or they were told to come to that decision. And suspiciously, none of my old friends said a word in my defense. The only guy who did was one Jewish professor of music over there who came to my defense. He was the only guy. And that was the case with, with Barnes, too. Um, and thank God for that German think tank, or else he would have he would have been in a lot of trouble. And in my case, Willis Cardo and the Barnes Review and the Spotlight and later the American Free Press, that's how I was able to make a living. This is, this is Willis Cardo's great, great legacy is that he was able to make the money and organize people such that guys like me could have a place to uh, work and study and do research where no one else would, would have us. And I'm pretty sure that I was removed later on from Mount St. Mary's and a few other places because of my connection with the Barnes Review, because it was a, a you know fairly large, substantial uh, group that was infamous and was on the ADL's uh, hit list for a long time. So, you know, so we, we're, we're similar in that respect, but that's that's really how it goes in the academic world. But once we hit that truth, once we have that that moment where we say we can't accept this anymore, and we have to start asking questions that get more and more radical as time goes on, um, then we become more and more knowledgeable. And we see just how bad the lies are and how our colleagues are simply going along. They know this stuff isn't true. They're, they don't examine these things. They're not scholars. And to some extent, they know it especially if they're white males. You know, Barnes, you know, basically being, you know, an academic, you know, and you talked about journalism. And so let's put that in perspective of the magazine that bears his name. Do you think the Barnes Review is more of a academic publication or do you think it's more of a journalistic publication or do you think that it's a combination or how do you think that has fallen? Now, I've thought about this for a long time. One of the reasons I was hired was to make it more of an academic publication. You have academic journals that are solely for university professors. Um, you know, journals like Political Theory, History of Political Thought, um, the American Political Science Review, you know, those are specifically for academics. They use that exclusive academic verbiage and they're very strict in terms of, of citations and everything else. Then you have you know, activist journals like Human Events, you know, the Nationalist Times, uh, Spotlight, American Free Press. These are, these are, you know, these are meant for activists. These are meant for ordinary people to learn about this stuff. But then you have a whole bunch of journals in the middle. The Barnes Review is one. Um, in the National Review is another one. Uh, Foreign Affairs is another one. Um, God, even like The Nation on the left, partisan review for the, for the left, uh, they're, in, they're in between. They have a lot of uh, academic sounding things, but they also have quite a few things that are, that are more popular. Um, and you can, like National Review, it's always been, uh, I, I don't agree with them, but, but they're great in the respect that they, they're both. They're highbrow without strictly being academic. And one of my problems personally has been that I'm often too academic for a popular audience, and too popular for an academic order. 
And that could be a good thing. E. Michael Jones is in the same boat since we have a very similar career in that respect. So, you know, um, the Barnes Review is like the National Review in that sense. It's, it's in between those two. It's highbrow without being strictly academic. And I think that type of journal is really important in building um, uh, an intellectual uh, attack against the system. Barnes was an innovator. He began writing this stuff right after World War II. He was the first to deal with this, these, these things, the Holocaust and, and war guilt and all that. His ideas have been expanded by so many other people that putting something by him at this point is almost like, well, everyone knows that. For our people, it's kind of, we, we know this already. At the time, that wasn't the case. But, um, right. but because he was such a, you know, he was the first guy, it's, this is the foundation. We all know that stuff. So putting him, at the time it was radical, it's not radical anymore. Hello, I'm Tom Strain, Lieutenant Commander-in-Chief of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Confederate flag, Confederate symbols, and the reputation of our Confederate ancestors has come under attack. The Sons of Confederate Veterans is actively fending off our detractors, but there is only so much that we can do. We need your help. Contact your local, state, and national elected politicians and tell them that you will not tolerate these attacks on our heritage. You can also visit scb.org, download an application to join us in our fight to preserve our Southern heritage. Visit scb.org today. If you don't have a Confederate ancestor and you are tired of American history disappearing, you can assist us by becoming a friend of the SCB. Please visit scbheritagedefense.org and make a donation to the Heritage Defense Fund. We hope that you will join us in the fight to defend the Confederate soldier's good name. I found Dr. Johnson's closing comments to be of particular interest when he was saying that the things that Dr. Barnes was writing were considered revolutionary and cutting edge in their day, but that they're now they're just things that we all know and understand. And so, you know, if we were to publish Barnes's writings in the Barnes Review magazine, people would be like, well, you know, uh, we already know that. Well, you know, well, that's so simplistic. That's so basic. When Barnes was writing those things, that wasn't the case bring that out because sometimes at the Barnes Review we get asked the question, why don't you have more articles written by Dr. Barnes? And that's the reason. But I hope you've enjoyed this a tribute to Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes. He is definitely one of my intellectual and ideological heroes. And that is why the Barnes Review bears his name, not because he's one of my heroes, but because he's someone who's worthy of being an ideological and intellectual hero to so many hundreds of thousands and millions of people, and he is. Next week, we will continue our tribute. Dr. Johnson will be our guest again, and he will talk about what it was like to work with Willis Carteau, the founder of TBR Magazine, what it was like to be hired by Willis, what it was like to be mentored by Willis Carteau. It'll be a tribute show to Willis Carteau. After that, we will have another former editor of the American Free Press, Dr. Pat Shannon, who is an investigative reporter, and we will have him on, and he also will be paying homage and tribute to Willis Carteau, Willis being someone who very much uh, groomed him and mentored him in the early portion of his career as well. Uh, of course, uh, Willis Carteau is uh, somebody who, uh, you know, I only wish I could have come around just a few years before I did birthwise and then come into the movement, if you will, a few years before I did, and I could have had some quality time to have sat at the feet of Willis Carteau as well. But you'll definitely want to tune in again next week, and uh, that will be the subject of our show, and I know it will be of interest to you. I'd also like to encourage you to go to the Barnes Review website, www.barnesreview.org. On that website, you can find out about the Barnes Review. We have, of course, the Barnes Review magazine. We have the Barnes Review bookstore. There are a lot of great materials in there, including some written by Dr. Harry Elmer Barnes. Also, on the Barnes Review website, we have TBR Radio, and you can find out how to uh, stay tuned to this program, as well as to my other show, TBR Radio Presents, The Dixie Heritage Show. Another thing we have is a podcast section. 
not dedicated radio shows, but just podcasts on a number of subjects. The one most recently posted is what I call the Poor Boys Horology Podcast, and it's just me talking about watches and my watch collection. And uh, during the course of 2012, I am going to post 12 episodes of the Horology Podcast, so you'll, you'll want to tune in to each and every one of those. There are also some other great podcasts on there as well. Some of them were done by our guest today, Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson, talking about various subjects of his passion, which of course is the study of and the history of Russia. Dr. Johnson, our guest, of course, has written the book, The Soviet Experiment, which is available in the Barnes Review Bookstore there at barnesreview.org. You can also find out there at barnesreview.org how you can get your hands on the recently released January-February issue of the Barnes Review magazine, which has two articles in it written by yours truly. One of them on Missionary to China, Lottie Moon, and the other is a version of the Jesse James story that is just going to blow your mind. If you can't imagine an alternate universe where Jesse James is not a criminal, where Jesse James is not a murderer, uh, imagine an alternate universe where Jesse James was actually a Baptist preacher. Guess what? That alternate universe was a real universe, and it was our own universe. Anyways, uh, you'll have to get your hands on the magazine to find out about that, or you'll have to tune into my show, TBR Radio Presents, The Dixie Heritage Show, to find out about Jesse James. Uh, here later in the month, we'll also be doing an interview with Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Kennedy, Colonel Kennedy was, of course, for a number of years, 20-some years, the professor of military history at the Army Staff College in Leavenworth, Kansas. He will be our guest once every month here on this show, and each month we're going to talk about a different battle in history. The first two months we'll be talking about war between the states battles. I want to say the next two months we'll be talking about World War II battles, then some Korean War battles, some Vietnam War battles, and so forth. But again, you'll want to stay tuned. We've got some really exciting things coming your way. Also, if you notice some glitches, some bugs, if it looks like we're still trying to get our footing, remember, this is a new show and we're in our infancy. And it takes a little while sometimes to work out the bugs in a new show. But don't worry, we are going to get there. And uh, we ask you to take this journey with us. This is going to be an exciting year in TBR Radio. And we do have just a few moments left here to bring us to the end of the hour on this week's show. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish out the hour with an old German patriotic song from the First World War. It was, I am told, one of Dr. Barnes's favorite of the German military tunes. And the title of this one is Die Wacht im Rhein, or the Guardian of the Rhine, and it is a song about, uh, you know, standing watch over the Rhine River and protecting it and also protecting the German fatherland. And so I'm going to let that song take us to the end of the hour, and of course I look forward to uh, being back with you again next week. <laughs>